Welcome to Blue Rain Gallery podcast. Today we're going to do something a little special. Uh, back in October, I had the opportunity, uh, under the direction of the Museum of New Mexico Foundation, to interview Preston Singletary for an upcoming exhibit at the Museum of Indian Art and Culture here in Santa Fe. This exhibit will be opening up uh, later this year. Hopefully you enjoy it. It's 30 to 40 minutes long. And um, enjoy. Hello, my name is Jamie Clements and I am president of the Museum of New Mexico Foundation. I wanna welcome you to this special presentation on native glass art. Our special guests tonight are Leroy Garcia, owner of Blue Rain Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, who will interview Preston Singletary, a renowned native glass artist based in Washington State. I now invite you to sit back and enjoy the show. Welcome to tonight's interview with Preston Singletary, a uh, glass artist extraordinaire from the Northwest Coast. Um, I first met uh, Preston in 1998. I had uh, read an article in uh, Indian Artist Magazine at the time, and um, it just struck me that somebody uh, in the native genre was working in glass. Uh, prior to that, Blue Rain had tried to sell uh, carved masks and uh, bent wood boxes and all these wonderful uh, things from the Northwest Coast. We, we just couldn't make way uh, with that medium. And so I remember calling Preston and I'm like, hey, Preston, this is Leroy Garcia. I own a gallery in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, we, we sell native, contemporary native art. We'd love to sell your work as well. And he's like, oh, well. Maybe I'll send you a couple of pieces. And uh, so our relationship started and um, away we went uh, almost 23 years now uh, working together. So I feel honored to be able to uh, interview Preston today. Uh, we've had a wonderful journey and uh, he's considered in, in many people's minds, but especially mine as a pioneer in the field. And um, he's, He's been uh, great at sharing uh, his knowledge with others and uh, really appreciate that. Um, so let's talk about glass. Preston, um, are, you, are you on? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, there we go, there we go. So um, tell us about how you got started in glass itself because at first you were not necessarily doing native imagery. Ta tell us who started this whole journey out for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, a good friend from Seattle um, actually moved up from California uh, named Dante Marioni. Dante <clears throat> had a father, well, <laughs> has a father who is also a, an old uh, hippie glass artist, um, very involved with the Pilchuck Glass School. And so Dante, you know, Paul was the first glass artist I ever met, and that was in uh, 19. 76 or something and um so dante and I became really fast friends dante started working in the glass uh taking lessons and working for the glass size studios in 1982 um he was working there full time and i was kind of in between jobs i was um working in restaurants and things like that and uh he called me up and said hey i can get you a job at the glass eye studios glass eye factory and so I started working there as the night watchman. I kind of quickly, I mean, I knew a lot of the people that worked there and they knew me well, you know, seeing me as a teenager growing up. So they got me onto the, the production floor pretty quickly. Um, I was about six months later and uh, just kind of threw me into the, into the, onto the work floor. And, and I started to make Christmas balls and paperweights and things like that. Um, you know, like 1983, uh, I met uh, Lino Telia Pietra, um, the Italian master of glass bar. I was able to watch him blow glass, and that kind of fueled the uh, enthusiasm with Dante and I. We wanted to learn these techniques and and pushed ourselves to uh, to develop them together. And I used to assist him and many many other people um, through Benjamin Moore's uh, Glass Studios, uh, another prominent glass artist in Seattle. Um, 
so I basically learned through practical experience. I learned uh, through working with other people. I learned by going up to the Pilchuck Glass School. I, um, you know, so that that was the the foundation. And it wasn't until 1988 that I started to dabble in the in the form line design, uh, which I call you know the art the the design style that makes up my uh, my uh, cultural uh, art style, um, and that's kind of how it started. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, your heritage. Uh, tell us a little bit about your dad and your mom. Yeah, I mean my my mother. Um, is uh, half Clinket and half Filipino. Um, my great grandmother was, um, she moved down from Sitka, Alaska in the 20s. And so she, uh, she was widowed and she was remarried. She brought uh, her children, including my grandmother, um, who uh, in turn in the Seattle area met a Filipino man and then married him. And uh, so my, that's how my mother, the Filipino, was introduced into the family. Um, my father is non-native, so he's mixed European, but uh, both my parents are very creative and very, um, you know, had a lot of varied interests. And so that's where I feel like I got a lot of my creative uh, impetus, you know, to, to, to work with lots of different things. Um, uh, my mother and my father were very handy and and uh, played music and sang Delta Blues. And so it was always a lot of creativity around me. And that's where I feel, uh, I mean, so my first love is music, you know, and I like to talk about that a lot, but the, uh, the, um, the glass art th that I do um, is what supports my music habit, so. <laughs> so let's let's talk about um, this. So you you were raised, uh, born and raised in Seattle. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So I was born outside of the uh, Clinket community. I was raised around uh, glass glass blowers. <laughs> yeah. So so um, having a little bit of disconnect from your heritage. When did you start taking interest in your heritage as Clinket? Um. You know. So my my great grandmother. We, you know, we spent a lot of time with her and we have a big, have a lot of cousins and aunties. And so um, still connected to that matrilineal kind of society that is the, the native community um, and uh, raised by, you know, my grandmother and my aunties, you know, supported by all these women. Um, and, you know, a lot, some of my aunties are really, really involved in the native community, um, sort of a multi national native community in the, in the Northwest. But uh, uh, we spent a lot of time around my great grandmother and she always impressed upon us where she came from, uh, where we came from. And uh, when I started to think about uh, how to create my own kind of uh, unique mark in the glass, uh, uh, the glass world and the glass uh, uh, with the material of glass, I, I decided, well, I should look to my, my cultural background. And so then I started to develop that. And that's really how, you know, it reconnected me with uh, family, um, with my tribe, with my community. And that was one of the most fulfilling things that I could have done. So is this where you're getting your knowledge of uh, design and stories and stuff from your aunties and your grandma? You know, it, it, it was... Um, I've been able to synthesize stories from my family and make them in art uh, art pieces, you know, through totem poles and and other sort of narratives that I create around the artwork. Um, so in in some ways, you know, I'm looking back and looking, reflecting on on the traditional stories and symbolism, and then sometimes I'm able to make it more abstract and make it uh, and make new interpretations. So that's kind of um, where I find myself today. So when when was your uh, first native form made? Because you were you were studying yeah. a more European uh, classical. Yeah, forms I mean, and I, so the early the early glass blowing process, I was all about learning the material, uh, learning how to handle it, and what can I do with it, how to shape it, you know, and then getting physically acclimated to the process, and so. Um, I uh, started dabbling in about 1988 uh, while I was at the Pilchuck Glass School, and I figured out a um, uh, kind of a sandblasting etching process that 
um, I saw another artist was using and I thought that I could maybe employ that to create the design work on my glass pieces. And so um, like, like the piece that's right behind you, uh, Leroy, you know, that, that, that panel really typical of the design style that I had to become accustomed to. And, and so it was really a, a kind of a relearning or a reinventing myself, um, you know, because I wasn't uh, an illustrator or I didn't have, I wasn't really adept at drawing, but I had to, you know, to train and practice and find mentors and find, um, you know, uh, ways of learning you know I, in the very beginning i was copying things out of books and you know until i really got it till it clicked until i understood the architecture of the design style and then i can um, create infinite varieties of designs uh you know uh for the future so i noticed the, the when we first started working together you made a lot of discs and hats and globe rattles and it was almost uh, limited to those three type of <laughs> images. Yeah. Um, and then you made uh, some of your first rattles that we got. We were so impressed. It's like, wow, yeah. check this out in glass. When did yeah. you come up with the idea to experiment into rattles? Well, you know, for a long time, I, I tried to uh, mimic certain kinds of things uh, in the material of glass, you know, if it was a bowl or if it was a dish. And, um, you know, so as my skills evolved and I was able to advance the style, I took workshops up at Pilchuck from uh, Pino Signorito, who's another Italian master who uh, was a very amazing sculptor he made figures and he could he could manipulate the glass in such a way that it gave me a lot of um, insight into how could I you know develop my work and push it in new ways and so as I've you know taken uh, you know this sculpting approach very seriously I've been able to push into new into new territory uh, and I try to do that all the time um, so, th th so I noticed the shapes were transforming more complex shapes, but your your designs were getting tighter and more definitive to um, a lot of the Northwest Coast seems like their imagery is based uh, along the lines of tra transformation from animal to human form. Is that yeah. something you still follow? Is that the main design? Yeah, this? yeah, that's, you know, so there's... Um, a lot of the artwork and totem poles, you know, it, it's a visual language and it's an oral tradition. And so these totem poles and uh, and all these designs basically pertain to certain families. So there's a lot of there's a lot of issues of intellectual property around uh, my cultural art. Um, certain stories belong to certain families, and you're not really, you know. Uh, supposed to use them for monetary gain you know there's you know the system for the artwork the production of the artwork has changed uh drastically over the years um uh and and but you know i find that the the shaman material is is something that's really rich in imagery and imagination and you know when i'm looking at the old shaman material to me it also kind of alludes to the spiritual uh, component of the of our community, um, and so the things that I make that are inspired by shamans' amulets—they're not really shaman amulets, but they are um, inspired by that type of thing. And you know, over the years, I've been able to figure out ways how to create more narratives around them, so I can give them. You know, maybe I had some kind of. Um, you know, uh, an experience or something, and then and like, oh, I could, I could, man I could manifest that in a particular art piece. So I could put myself as a human figure and have you know this raven uh, figure next to it, and you know, then I can you know kind of make up a story around that. You know, the something, something that might have happened. So that's where the you know the really the the fun kind of begins. I mean, every day is uh, is a new adventure for for me. When I go into my studio, it's just like, okay, you know, well, what am I going to make? It, you know, it, there's an element of um, kind of fun and excitement there. Now, before we go on, I, I, I was hoping you would uh, recant uh, the story of your, your grandmother and uh, the, the bears out there. Oh, yeah. yeah so, 
I made a, I made a, a totem pole that was um, represented my great grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child, and she um, it was I mentioned she lived in Sitka, Alaska. And it was the time at the turn of the century. There was a lot of Russians in that area, and there was a woman who made saltwater taffy, and she um, you know for sale. And so my great grandmother would go out and pick berries in the forest. Uh, and bring them back and sell them to people to get Russian money so she could buy taffy for her little, her pet, you know. And so I made this uh, totem pole. It was a, a seven and a half foot sculpture. I worked collaboratively with carvers, you know, and I'll design the totem pole and then I'll have people carve it for me. And in this case, I actually transformed it into glass. So about 2,000 pounds of glass, um, you know, this totem pole stands, uh, you know, seven and a half feet. And uh, so, in, so in that way, I'm, I feel like I'm keeping the tradition alive because the totem poles actually should tell a story. That's, that's their purpose, you know. And with that object, then the person can tell the narrative of that story. That's awesome. I, I love that story. <laughs> it's good to uh, remember those uh, things in our, in our family's past. Uh, some of them are fun. Um, let's turn and talk about uh, your relationship with Blue Rain and the journey that we've had together. Um, like I said, in, in 1998, uh, for some reason, you took a risk on us <laughs> and uh, came into the gallery. Uh, by 2000, uh, I had invited you and uh, your assistant, Joe uh, Benavido, uh, and you drove your little hot shop all the way from Seattle <laughs> to Taos. Yeah. And, Oh, that, that was a historic moment because it was the first time uh, we were able to introduce the process uh, to the native art community or to the collectors of the native art community. Mm -hmm. And it started opening their eyes. And I mean, we, we were selling things, not at the rate we were now, but it was the beginning. You know, we were yeah. setting a, a yeah. foundation. Uh, tell us about those, those early days in house. Yeah, I, you know, that was uh, one of my, one of the things I miss is the trips up to Taos. I love going up there. Um, I used to love having an excuse to go up there. Um, not that I couldn't, I can't go there right now. But uh, I, I uh, yeah, Leroy called me out of the blue and you know, left a message on my phone. And that was sort of like a, um, you know, that was a common thing, you know, that, you know, so 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 and so from this gallery in um, you know Chattanooga, it's wherever you know, in the middle of somewhere I didn't know, um, and um, so I called them back, and then there was no there was no answering machine, and I was like, what kind of gallery doesn't even have an answering machine on their, you know, for their business? I'm like, gosh, you know, I don't know about these guys. Okay, so then we get into this conversation. Leroy's like, oh yeah, we're Blue Rain Gallery, and you know, we, we uh, you know. Anyway, he sold me. I, I came down. Um, first couple of shows, or it was, I don't know if it was just the first one or first and second or whatever. Um, we, um, yeah, I mean, I brought my work down there, uh, set it up in the gallery. It looked great, you know, and uh, people looked at it and looked at it and circled it and looked at it and, zoop, you know, like right over to the ceramic pots, you know, probably Tammy's work or something, you know. And then I was like, you know, because, you know, the thing is in the Northwest, you know, the glass is, has such a, such a high kind of uh, profile, you know, there is ceramics here too. When the glass came along, you know, the ceramics were kind of like, you know, cousins, but, you know, kind of in competition with each other. And so um, anyways, you know, we, we, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, I flew back home kind of, oh gosh, you know, tail between my legs, you know, like didn't, didn't have a great show, but I love the experience. I love getting to know everybody. I love, um, you know, the gallery's perspective of like working with a lot of contemporary native people and, you know, many of which became really great friends. And I, and so, you know, I, I, I loved, you know, going down and seeing the, the, the market. I love going down and, um, uh, you know, meeting new people, seeing what, uh, Native artists are doing, you know, uh, how do they interpret their culture for, you know, this current day and age, right? So uh, the glass blowing demos did uh, serve a great function of, uh, of uh, educating people around, you know, how much work it goes into making a glass piece. And I remember that particular show, you, I, you know, so we did the demo, we put the piece away, 
you know, put it in the box and people were, you know, clapping and then, and then they kind of like wandered into the, into the gallery and then started buying pieces. Like <laughs> it was like, Oh my God. You know? So it was, it was like the, the curse was broken, you know, and, uh, um, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, I find more and more people, you know, the more, I mean, I've been coming down, what, for 22 years now or more. And, and, um, and so, yeah, that collector community is just always amazing and supportive. And, you know, I just, you know, I can't say enough about that and, and Leroy's connection to them and bringing them into the gallery and what have you. So it's been a great partnership. <laughs> Let's talk about for the last ten minutes of this segment uh, or for, of this interview. Let's talk about what I consider the biggest uh, introduction of glass into the native art community, uh, especially the, the ceramics. Was when I think me and you were on the same page. We're like, you know, yeah. Preston, you, you're carving into glass. Uh, Tammy Garcia is carving into clay. Why can't we do? glass with those type of imageries. Mm -hmm. And so can you can you talk about the, the first collaboration uh, with Tammy? And yeah, how yeah, I mean, so I remember kind of hinting around at it for, you know, almost every time because I was like, wow, this, this really, we should really do this. And eh, you know, the time wasn't right. And then finally, you know, we got together on the same page and said, let's, let's do it. Let's, I mean, it was such a no brainer to me because of the, the carving process and the stencil process that I use would be, you know, able to translate those designs perfectly. And, um, and uh, so we had a great time. I mean, we got together and worked in the hot shop together um, we, you know, these designs were very traditional and I, and I really, it was kind of, you know, going back to my roots as a glass blower, uh, making, you know, traditional vessels. So that was really fun for me. And I thought that the, the results were spectacular. I mean, I thought, I mean, I got, I, again, like I say, working being around other contemporary native artists is really a key factor. I, let me just say in the broader context, indigenous artists, because I've, you know, I've worked with Maori and, uh, New Ze uh, and from New Zealand and uh, Australian Aboriginal artists, natives from all over, all around the country. Um, and that is really what kind of um, uh, gives me a lot of inspiration because it makes me it challenges me and uh, I, I do things that I wouldn't normally do. And then by way of doing that, I can show examples um, on a very high level what, what the possibilities are. Um, and from, from my perspective, uh, what that show did too, where, where Tammy was already in an elevated form uh, as far as her collector base, it, it, it put you in a position of hey pay attention to this <laughs> you know because that uh, that component too for sure yeah because it, it was introducing you to the highest end of the collector base that we had and i think that helped elevate some things right there uh, then uh you did three three collaborative shows with tammy i think you guys produced about 120 plus pieces or so over those years <laughs> uh, we did uh, three shows and then in between that, uh, the Tammy shows, you did uh, the Maori show, and then uh, you did a show with Marcus Emmerman. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that show uh, was beautiful. It's historic, but we had a hard time getting people to connect with it because mm. Mar Marcus is such a great artist, but he's a beater. You know, he's one of the best beat artists out there. Uh, yep. but, but what he chose to do with you was mound uh pots with faces and stuff mm -hmm. but I, I figured that, that was a pretty good challenge for you trying to figure out how to do faces and pots yeah that was a challenge that I mean that like I said it, it always kind of pushing me out of my comfort zone and um and and I learn by doing that interacting with all these these different artists yeah um how was it when the first time you took uh Jody Naranjo to to the uh glass shop do you remember her eyes <laughs> yeah that was that was really a lot of fun. I mean, Jody is such a great person, and you know, really creative, and just a lot of fun to be around. I mean, she's just like you know, irresistible. Uh, you know, working with her was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, again, getting back to the classical vase forms, um, and you know, just like you know, just to see her excitement and enthusiasm uh, around, you know seeing us make the work you know i mean it was, i 
I was always pushing to like make it just perfect, you know. And she goes, "Oh no, no, that's fine. Stop there, you know. Uh, <laughs> that looks great, you know. Don't do anything more to it, uh, you know." And and so yeah, there's and and now she's really uh, applying herself and taking the next step and cutting the stencil. I used to cut everyone's stencil, uh, you know, that I worked with, um, but she uh, now she's learning how to do that herself, and um, it makes the work, you know, even better and and easier uh for both of us so yeah it's, it's pretty fun i think in this upcoming show we also have works that you did uh, collectively with uh, harlan Riano. and I, I wanted you to talk about the scale of difficulty of doing the figurative work with, <laughs> oh, with, with harlan yeah oh god that was uh that was a challenge. So he wanted these uh, kind of warrior figures or clown figures, and they were like, you know, these hands that are pumped up like this, and um, you know, and then these stylized heads and all this. And um, so each element had to be made in advance, and each element had to be brought back up to temperature and kind of stuck and melted onto the form. And and then the the design work was just wrapped around every you know bicep and and body and it was oh my god it was just such a challenge to cut those stencils but they were you know again um those were another thing that challenged me but it's that's the that's the beauty of it it was a, a body of work that but well, technically we had thought would take six months and it ended up taking almost two years <laughs> yeah think about that yeah, there's a, a lot of yeah really really hard work i i yeah, right. I hope everybody who's watching this uh, Zoom conference gets a chance to see the exhibit and, and see your influence. Um, there's a couple other uh, people in this show. I, I don't have the total list, but one of them's Ira Lujan. And I know that he, you've been a big influence on him and particularly through uh, Pilchuck School. And then I, I don't know if uh, Spooner Marcus was involved in that as well. Did he get up there to uh, Pilchuck or where did he I, learn his class? I don't recall if he's been to Pilchuck, but Ira's a good, you know, just a, a great guy and you know i'm so happy for his success and uh growth you know as an artist and uh glass maker um you know he's pushing himself and and trying new things all the time as well and um but that's really cool to see the glass really take a get a foothold in this in the southwest you know that was one thing that i think is really really important um and now that you know with the work that spooner and and Ira and even uh, Ramson Lomotawama, you know, he's he's another uh, uh, he's Hopi, you know, and he was up at Pilchuck. I met him in, geez, like 2000 or yeah, 2005 or six or something. And yeah, so we, it's been great to you know keep up with these guys and see that they they're getting some, you know, some good uh, support for their work. Yeah, the other person was uh, Tony Tony Hula. Tony Hola, Hol yeah. Tony is, uh, you know, and Tony, yeah, of course, Tony. I mean, gosh, Tony was the guy I met in 1984, the very first year that I went up to Pilchuck. So that was like two years after I started blowing glass. I go up to Pilchuck and I meet Tony Hola and Larry Avacana, like, and they're, you know, two natives, you know, and I was like, okay, so I was, I, you know, I, you know, so I go up to Larry, I was like, oh, I'm Alaskan native too. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm from Barrow, Barrow, Alaska. He says, "Yeah, I went, I once like uh, built a, a a glass studio on the permafrost up in Barrow, Alaska, and I was blowing glass <laughs> until until you know the heat from the furnace started to melt the ice, and the the you know, the furnace started to list off, and you know over to the side, and they had to shut it down. But um, yeah, so those guys, I mean, some of the earliest pioneers of of glass art. Um, also included in the exhibition and you know those guys too I mean got to give them a lot of credit for like encouraging me you know when I was just a, a two-year glass blower uh, at that time and they they really uh, um, those guys are some of my greatest uh, mentors and greatest friends well Preston I know we could probably spend uh, hours talking I uh, want to thank you for for attending and hopefully you get some good questions uh, yeah. not only are you a pioneer but you're an ambassador and I hope uh, these exhibits elevate you to uh, where you're going thank you for listening to this wonderful uh, 
podcast with uh, Preston Singletary. We'd like to encourage everybody uh, to subscribe uh, to our podcast. You can go on our webpage and look under podcasts, or you can subscribe to YouTube, um, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Um, until the next time. Hey, I know, hey, 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 oh.